Shalom, friends. Welcome to the Shi'ur in Talmud, Gemara, Masechet, Brachot, Tractate Blessings. And we are learning from the Korean Talmud, Bavli. As you can see, it's a very beautiful edition in front of us over here. We have the original text. We have some translation as well as notes, pictures and diagrams, everything to help us find our way around the Gemara. Please feel free to follow along as I'm discussing the subject with you. Feel free to read the different sections as we're working through it. If there's something that I've missed or perhaps something I may have accidentally in translated incorrectly, you'll catch it and be aware of what I've said and take note and uh, just follow along and enjoy the Shi'ur. I'm Eliyahu Shir, coming to you from Chesed Ve'emet, my site www.lovingkindness.co. So we're on Tractate Blessings and we're currently on uh, Chapter 2 and we're on Daf Tet Zayin Amud Base, that is page 16. We're on the second side of the page. Now, we started off the Mishnah last week, this new Mishnah that we were discussing. We spoke about the story that Rabban Gamliel would, he washed himself on the first night that after his wife had died, he washed himself. And we learned out from this a very strange thing because halakhically speaking, it is forbidden to wash during at least the seven days after a person who is a near relative has died. The custom of mourning is, of course, seven days, and in fact, 30 days. And yes, of course, there may be certain circumstances that require one to wash more regularly. Well, this we learn, interestingly enough, from this very Mishnah, where Rabban Gamliel told his students who had criticized him for washing on this first night, he said to them that, he was an Easternist. He says that he's, he's a gentle fellow. He's a sensitive fellow. He's the type of person that if he doesn't wash for a moment, he feels a little bit uncomfortable and he needs to know that he feels totally comfortable and therefore he chose to wash himself. And then we learned another law from this Mishnah that he had a servant by the name of Tovi or Tavi. However, we're reading the name according to the pronunciation, the Ashkenazi pronunciation, the Sfadi pronunciation, Tavi referring to Tovi, Tov, he's, he has a, a part of goodness inside him. He was a unique type of servant who worked for Rabban Gamliel. And when he died, Rabban Gam Gamliel accepted uh, consolation, condolences, for the fact that his servant had died and the students again asked him it's a very strange thing they do is this normal that we accept consolation condolences for one's servant one's evet kanani one's canaanite servant that has passed on how, how is it that a jew is accepting consolation for him and we said that rabbi gamliel answered and he said tovi my servant isn't like other servants he's kosher he's somebody who's really great and therefore it was fitting to accept the condolences and the consolation for his servants. Now, we continued again on to the third part of the Mishnah, where we said that a Katan who wishes to read the Kriyat Shema on the first night that he gets married is permitted to do so. And Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel says that not everybody who wishes to regard himself in such a light with such arrogance, so to speak, may take upon himself the obligation of reciting the Kriyat Shema in the evening because he should have other thoughts on his mind and by doing so it's kind of like an arrogant type of thing as if to say that even though the average person cannot concentrate he can concentrate and those were the words of the Mishnah and then we went into the Gemara and we discussed a few points over here if you recall and there was another story over here about the servants of Rabbi Eliezer if you recall from last week contradicting the story of Rabban Gamliel, where when his maidservant died, he actually ran away from his students who were coming to console him. And he was trying to teach them that we don't really accept the consolation for the sake of a servant or a maidservant. And this was, in, in fact, totally contradictory to the story of Rabban Gamliel. And so we learned two perspectives of the same type of story. And that's part of the process of halakha, that we have the opportunity to see the one side of the story. We have the opportunity to see the other side of the story. And what we need to be able to do is to differentiate and to know when a particular instance of something in halakha applies to ourselves. And of course, if we find ourselves in doubt and we don't know what to do, we need to appoint for ourselves a halakhic authority who we trust, somebody who we know believes in us, somebody who we know 
wants the best for us. And when we ask him our Shaila, obviously a competent halakhic authority, not just anybody in the street. We're talking about somebody who is competent, who is authoritative, who is uh, sincere, somebody who is dedicated to Torah, somebody who is a Yerei Shamayim. This is the type of person who is fitting and, of course, knowledgeable in all areas of Torah and certainly the area that he's being asked the question in. This is the type of person who is fitting to give off halakhic rulings. And he does this by this process of seeing the contradictions within the halakha. On the one hand, we see a story that took place where consolation was given to somebody's servant. On the other hand, we see that the one rabbi ran away from it. So which is the correct halakha? At this point in time, of course, the Gemara is not telling us the halakha. That is the duty of the Shulchan Aruch and the Rambam and all the various other major halakhic authorities who will go into that in depth. This is an exciting section in the Talmud, and I hope that you will enjoy the following sections that are still to come. So stay tuned to some of the most wonderful parts of the Gemara that we're going to be learning at this point in time are going to be coming up in the near future. Tanu Rabbonin, we're starting. The rabbis taught in a brighter. Ein koirim avos ela lishloisha. We call the Avot, the forefathers, by only three of them. There are only three forefathers. And we don't call the four mothers, meaning the F-O-R-E mothers, the four mothers, the mothers of the Jewish people, except four. In other words, the Gemara is telling us that we have only three forefathers and we have four foremothers. The Gemara continues. Avos, my timer. Regarding the four fathers, meaning the three forefathers, what is the reason that there are only three of them? Ilema, key word in the Gemara, if you want to say, Mishum de lo yadinan, the reason that we only have three that we go back to, meaning to say, why don't we go back to the 12 tribes? Isn't that also, weren't they also our ancestors, were they not also part of the makeup of the Jewish people? Shouldn't we say that we all go back to these 12 tribes? If you say it's because we do not know. We don't know if we've come from Reuven, and we don't know if we've come from Shimon, meaning to say today, as the Jewish people are, most of us, probably all of us, don't really know, with the exception of perhaps the Livyim and the Kwanim, who to a certain extent will come from the tribe of Levi, if of course all the Kwanim are to be believed that they are Kwanim. So in any case, we're not quite sure where we really come from. But nevertheless, the idea is that let's say that they come from, uh, they come from Levi. But the rest of us, for sure, we have no clue where we come from. Perhaps we come from Reuven, perhaps we come from Shimon. Ihachi. If so, says the Gemara, imahos nami. So too with regards to the four mothers, meaning the four four mothers. Lo yadinan. We don't know. Ime Rachel ka asenan. If we come from Rachel, imilea ka asenan. Or if we come from Leia. Nobody knows today if we come from Rachel or Leia. Fascinating thing. Today we know that there is the tomb of. Rachel Imenu, and when Jews come to Eretz Israel, whether on holiday, they come here to live, everybody goes to Daven at Ima Rachel, Mama Rachel, our, our foremother, Rachel. But who says we come from her? I mean, after all, think about it for a second. Mashiach is going to be a direct descendant of Yehuda, who ultimately comes from Leah, not even from Rachel. So it's quite interesting to think that everybody's going to Daven at the Kever, of Rachel, when in reality we don't really know who we come from. Do we come from Rachel or do we come from Leah? Who do you come from? Who do I come from? I'm not quite sure. Now, since we don't know who we come from, isn't it fair to say that somewhere along the line it is not fair to include Leah and Rachel within our ancestry because we don't know who we've come from, just like we don't include Ruvain and Shimon and Yehuda and everybody else because we don't know who we've come from. Likewise, we shouldn't include them. Ella, but rather, Ad Hacha Chashivei. 
the reason that we include them as being the four mothers, meaning the four four mothers, is because chashivei they are important. Tefei, but more than this, lo chashivei they are not important. Which means both on the side of the men and on the side of the women, the importance that, that is given over to the four fathers and the four mothers, the three four fathers, the four four mothers is the fact that those are the most important people who we go back to in terms of our ancestry. Beyond that, there is no more real importance. There's some sort of a breakage within the 12 tribes already, within Ruvain and Shimon and so on and so forth, that we don't consider them to be our ancestry. And in any case, we don't, we don't know where we're coming from, but that's not relevant to the discussion. Tanya Itach, another teaching, says the following. We learned the following in another brighter. Avadim Ushvachot, regarding male servants and female maid servants. Ein koirim oisam abba ploni, we do not call them father so and so, the imma plonis, and mother so and so. Which means to say, even in those days, there was a concept whereby to an important person who we didn't know who they were. We would refer to them as father so and so, mother so and so. We know that there is a certain uh, there are certain people who refer to their leaders or their guides, or whatever, as father so and so and mother so and so. Well, in fact, in the days of the Talmud, we see that out of respect, one would call anybody who one didn't know on a personal level father so and so or mother so and so. Perhaps today we call them uncle so-and-so or auntie so-and-so, which is just a, an expression of respect. Now, it says over here that in another brighter it teaches that with regards to the servants and the maid servants, we do not call them by this honorific. We do not, we not say to them that they are called father so-and-so and mother so-and-so out of respect. Vishal Rabban Gamiel, hayu karim oisam abaploni ve'im aplonis. But when it came to the servants of Rabban Gamliel, they did used to call them father so-and-so, mother so-and-so. So the Gemara asks, my silly story, you're telling me a story about Rabban Gamliel who did have servants and they would call them mother, father so-and-so and mother so-and-so. Well, that seems to contradict the very teaching that we're learning in the Brisa. Why are you telling me this? Answer, Mishum de Chashiva. Because the reason is that they were important. It had nothing to do with the idea that they were considered to be servants or maid servants, etc., etc. It had to do with the idea of importance. When a person is important enough, irrespective if he's a servant or a maid servant, if his quality of being, of who he is, is important enough, he deserves the honorific, even if nobody knows who he is, as being called father so and so, mother so and so uncle so-and-so, auntie so-and-so, whatever the terms might be in modern times, that's how they used to speak to each other in those days. Omar Rabbi Elazar. Rabbi Elazar said the following, My Siv, what is it that is written? Key words in the Gemara, which teach us the following. What do the following words in the Torah come to teach us? What does it say? Kain avarechecho b'chayai Yes, or so, I shall bless you with my life when your name or to your name, I will lift up my palms or my hands. What does it mean? So shall I bless you with my life. This refers to the recital of the Kriyat Shema, the reading of the Shema. What does it mean in the Pasuk when it says, in your name, or through your name, or to your name, however we're going to translate these words to make them make sense in the context in which we're speaking about, I will lift up my palms, Zotafila. this refers to prayer, which means the Amida, wherever we see the word Tefila, in the Halaki context, in Gemara context, it most likely refers to the Amida. And if one does so, Alav Hakasuf Omer, about him, the verse says, about him, the text is saying, gives him honor and says, like the fats and other types of fats, fats and marrow, as with fat and marrow, my soul 
shall be satiated. The law ought, not only is that the case, but a person inherits two worlds. Ha'olam hazeh, this world, ha'olam haba, and the next world. Sheneh maris, it says, a pasuk in the Torah that proves this, the sifsei renanos yahalel pi, and the lips of rejoicing, my mouth shall praise you, with lips of joy, my mouth praises you. The plural joy refers to two joys, that of this world and that of the world to come. Rabbi Elazar, Listen to this beautiful teaching as we're going to continue now. Just before we do it, let us just read the notes on the side. One may only call three people patriarchs. Some explain that one who does not descend from these three patriarchs and four matriarchs is not eulogized. If you remember from our last shiur that we had together, we spoke about the idea of eulogizing servants and to what degree we should and whether we should or not altogether. And it seems to be that if one is not a descendant of the three patriarchs and the four matriarchs, that we should not give them a eulogy. And that is the connection between this passage and the laws of mourning for servants, as we've been discussing up until now. Father so-and-so, some explain that one should not call a slave father so-and-so, lest people conclude that the slave is actually his father and his lineage will be called into question. Only Rabban Gamliel, Gamliel slaves, could be addressed in that manner. As they were distinguished and due to their renown, there would be no confusion. Background, a story to contradict. What does this mean over here? My silly story. This is a common question raised when a Mishnah or Brighter cites a story which contradicts the halakha cited immediately before. Generally, stories are cited to reinforce a stated halakha by demonstrating that it is not merely a halakha in theory, but in practice as well. Therefore, when a story is incongruent with the previously cited halakha, it seems contradictory. As we said over here, Rabban Gamliel was giving us a contradictory story. On the one hand, we don't call the Abadim and the Shvachot by the terms Abba so-and-so, Ima so-and-so. And yet Rabban Gamliel is speaking about his students, uh, his, his servants, that they would call them Abba and Ima. And the reason was because of importance. It had nothing to do with father and mother, as if we're talking about ancestry and etc. that we come from them. Now we continue into a very exciting section of the Gemara. Omar Rabbi Elazar. Rabbi Elazar said the following. Uh, sorry, then we continue there. Rabbi Elazar, Basa de Messiah de Tose. Now, this Rabbi Elazar, who we're speaking about, since we're talking about him, after he concluded his prayer, Omar Haki, he would say the following. Now just imagine this for a second. Rabbi Elazar finishes davening his tefillah. We were speaking about this concept right here in the paragraph above. One who is using his lips to say the words of the Kriyat Shema. One who uses his lips to pray to God. This is something very special, very praiseworthy. And now the Gemara goes to the next section. Rabbi Lazar, the author of what we're speaking about here, said that the following happens. When he would finish davening his Shemona Esrei, he would recite the following words. There's a custom, for those who are interested in knowing, that the Shemona Esrei is not just a prayer about what the men of the Great Assembly put into the Shemona Esrei for us. But in fact, we can use the Shemona Esrei as a means to govern our own prayers. Now, many people, for example, think that the words of the sages are unnecessary, God forbid, and they think to themselves, why did the sages have to implement a form of prayer we could pray ourselves. We don't need the words of prayer from the Anshay Knesset HaGadayla to be these exact words. Every single day, three times a day, I must recite these particular prayers. Well, the answer is simple. The men of the Great Assembly gave to us a form of prayer that really includes everything. And if we were to pray on our own, perhaps as the day goes by, we would miss out on many parts of what we really need. We wouldn't ask for it because every time each prayer is completely new, there are many parts of our daily living that we take for granted that we might even forget to ask for. So the men of the Great Assembly made sure to include all parts of our needs within this prayer of the Shemona Esrei. Of course, let us not forget, all the words of the Shemona Esrei are divinely inspired and have a great effect above in any case, irrespective if they include particular things or they don't include it, ultimately they include everything. However, 
every person as an individual has the opportunity to include his own prayer within the Shemona Isra itself. For example, when a person is reciting, Rifa'enu Hashem, please heal us, God. Then at this point in time, he can include within it a prayer for healing for all people that he knows who are not well. And when, for example, he says, Barech Aleinu, the prayer of bless us, God, there is the prayer for Panasa, where a person can extend his prayer and he may include all sorts of requests for his needs of sustenance, of Panasa. However, the rabbi said that because it could be considered somewhat of an interruption, it is not ideal to include all of one's requests during the prayer itself. In fact, there are two main parts of prayer that we can use to put our own prayers. The first part is within Shema Kuleinu. Those who have a, an updated Siddur will notice that there is usually a circle that precedes the words Ki Ata Shomea Tefilas Koper or whatever version of prayer that you happen to be reading from. There's a circle there. And the circle tells you, if you read the notes below, that you are entitled to ask for anything that you want to as you daven your Shemona Esrei. So before you say, and you, God, listen to our prayer, you can actually add your own additions in. Please, God, help me with this. Help me with that. The, the tefillah of Shemona Esrei doesn't necessarily include a prayer for success in Torah in the way that we want to include it. So please, God, help me to be able to succeed in finishing off the Chumash this year. Please, God, help me to succeed in finishing the Shulchan Aruch this year. Please, God, help me to understand the words of the Talmud. Whatever it is, a person can include any words that he wants to, any requests, any desires. Likewise, if somebody's not well, God forbid, one may use that section of prayer to also include any prayers that he has for himself. However, there are still many authorities that say, ideally, it could be that one should not even include the prayer at that point in time, but rather wait until the very end of Shemona Esrei. And at the very end of Shemona Esrei, before he says the second year, just before he says those words, he may include any prayer that he wants to. It's kind of like he has finished off his Shemona Esrei, and now he may ask for whatever he wants to. There are some people who follow the first custom of including prayer within Shema Kuleinu. There are some people that follow the second custom by including their additional prayers after Sim Shalom, which means to say before the Hidu Ratzon, meaning Elokhain Tzor, at the very end of Shemona Esrei, to include all your requests over there, whatever you want to, because it is really the end of the Shemona Esrei. We have finished off the coding. We have finished off the mystical ideas that the men of the Great Assembly wanted to include within Shemona Esrei, that we recite three times a day. And now we move over to our own prayer. And there we can say whatever we want to. This is exactly the point where we come into the story that we're reading about now. Rabbi Elazar Basar de Messiaim Sotsei. Rabbi Elazar, after he concluded his prayer, Omar Hagi, he would say the following. This was his prayer when he finished off Shemona Esrei. Yehi ratzon milfanecho, may it be your will, Hashem elokeinu, Hashem our God, shetashkein bepureinu, that you should dwell in our lot, ahava v'achva, bring in love and brotherhood, v'shalom v'reot, and peace and friendship. Listen to these powerful words. I'm often amazed that many times a Jew is suffering, God forbid, and he goes to somebody and he says to this person, can you help me with X, Y, whatever it is, Z, Z. And the person says, no, I won't help you. God forbid. You need to work harder. You need to do this. You need to do that. Now, as we progress through these sections in the Gemara, pay attention carefully to the beautiful words that our sages would pray to God to ask God to help us to succeed. Our duty is to wish good for the other, no matter what. Meaning, if the person's a good person, of course, I'm not talking about evil people where we start blessing and saying, oh, it should be good for you. I'm not talking about this category. I'm talking about the average person that we bump into who's having a hard time. This type of person, we approach them and we say to them, God should help you. God should grant you panasa. God should grant you a wife. God should grant you a husband. God should grant you children. There should never be a stop in the process 
that should say as if to indicate there's something wrong with you. And therefore, it's up to you to do the improving. How do I know that? Because I'm reading these words in the Talmud. And these words in the Talmud tell me that these rabbis would say some very beautiful words of prayer. They would ask God for some wonderful things. Now, all we need to do is to master the language that we're about to read now, internalize it, and make these words be upon our tongues so that when we encounter another person, we can use this very same language to bless them and it should be well for them. Look at his words. Rabbi Elazar, when he finished praying, would say, may it be your will, God, our God, that you should cause to, to dwell in our lots, love and brotherhood, peace and friendship. And may you increase our borders with students. And may you make successful our ends, meaning when we get to the end of all of what we're doing, towards the end of our lives, whenever we get there, that there should be uh, at the end a, a, a hope and success. Please God, make for us that you should place our portion in the Garden of Eden. These are the words he said. You know when we say, instead we say, uh, at the end of the Shemona Isra, as we end off after Sim Shalom, we ask God for certain things. This is the word, these are the words that Rabbi Elazar would say. He would say, make successful our ends and our hope and place our portion in Gan Eden, and establish us for a good companion, and good inclination in your world. Vinashkim, let us get up, Vinimtsa, and we will find Yichul Levavenu, the aspiration of our hearts, Leira is Shemecha, to fear your name. Vesavolevanecha Kiras Nafshenu Leteva, and may they come before you, the satisfaction of our souls for the good. May you hear our prayers that we may have spiritual contentment in this world for the best. These were the words that Rabbi Elazar would say when he concluded his tefillah. Rabbi Yochanan, when it came to Rabbi Yochanan, Basad the Messiah Tzlose, after he would complete his prayer, he would also say some words. Omar Haki, he would say the following. May it be your will before you, Hashem our God. That you shall look on our shame. The sabit bara'asenu, and may you see the bad that happens to us. The sil silabesh bara'amecha, and may you enclose in your mercy. May you enclose yourself in your mercy. The tiskase buzecha, and may you enclose yourself, cover yourself over in your strength. The tisateif bechasiduscha, and may you envelop yourself in your piety. The tisazer bechaninuscha. And may you gird yourself in your grace, the Savolefanecha, and may they come before you, Mitas Tuvacha, the attribute of your goodness, the Anvesanusacha, and your humility. His prayer was one of asking God to be aware of who he is and how he's going to bless us. And he's asking for the very best once again. It is the nature of the Jew to ask for the best. Why? Because God is infinite which means to say he can provide anything. He does not lack for anything. The world is not lacking for anything. God has the ability to bless each person, not just with his needs, but even beyond his needs. Nothing has to necessarily restrict God from bringing blessing of any kind to any person, no matter what circumstances there may be. And therefore, when we conclude our prayer, we use the power of the tongue to say to God, please, God, do the very best that you have to give us the very best. Rabbi Zaira, what happened to Rabbi Zaira? Basar the Messiah Tzleise, Amarhaki. After he concluded his prayer, he would say the following: May it be the will before you, Hashem our God, that we not sin, not be embarrassed. And may we not have any shame 
from our far, uh, before our forefathers, may we not have any embarrassment in the sense that our actions should not disgrace the actions of our forefathers. This was the prayer of Rabbi Zaira. Rabbi Zaira was saying, please, God, help us that we should never sin. And may we never be embarrassed in front of others, in front of our forefathers, in front of anybody. We should never have to feel embarrassed because we never come to do anything that is of the nature that would cause us embarrassment. Rabbi Chia, he has another story. Basad Mitzale, after Rabbi Chia would pray, Amar Haki, he would say the following. May it be the will before you. Our God, your, before you, God, Elokeinu, our God, that it should be your Torah, should be our craft. May it be your will that I have no desire in the world except to involve myself in Torah. What does that mean? You know how people are. They get up at five o'clock in the morning. There's work to be done. They've got to get to their business. Stock to take. Things to do, accounting records to take care of, busy, busy, busy. The whole day they're busy taking stock, putting on stock, taking off merchandise, putting in merchandise, phoning the supplier, dealing with the distributor and the dealer, referring back to the final consumer. And then afterwards, this one and that one, and all things are happening. Eight o'clock in the evening, the boss returns home after a hard day of work. Wow, he's achieved some fantastic things. And there's nothing wrong with that, of course. He's done very well. But look at what Rabbi Chia's prayer is. Please, God, help that your Torah should be our vocation. I want that the Torah is my work. You see, because if I involve myself in physical, physical activities, I'm selling merchandise and things, I do very nicely. There's nothing wrong with that. And of course, especially the person who is involved in using his wealth to help other people, all the more so he sanctifies the work that he's doing. But still, which is the greater thing that a person can achieve within himself? Which is his desire? To be the worker or to be the person who is involving himself in the spiritual lifestyle to connect with Hashem? Which is the ideal? If we had the free choice, if we had $150 million in the bank account, if we had $20 billion in the bank account, would we rather choose to involve ourselves in work each day, five o'clock in the morning, get up, go to work, attend to the stock, the merchandise, make sure the shelves are all stocked correctly, see to it that the workers are working correctly. Is that what I want to do with my life, even though I've got $20 billion in my account? Or would I prefer to involve myself in the study of Torah? Why would I want Torah? Because Torah is what will help me to cleave to Hashem. It will help me to know what my goal is in the world, and it will bring me ultimately to the goal of what I'm actually here in the world for, which is not necessarily to eat and to drink, to shower and do shopping all day long and to take vacations on a regular basis and perhaps go and have a lot of fun all around the world, whatever I can do. I'm here in the world, as we've been discussing in many of our shiurim together, in order to serve Hashem, to become closer to Hashem, to become a spiritual being resting inside a physical body. So which path am I going to take? If I had the means, what would I really want my vocation to be? That's a question that people ask. They say like, you know, if you want to succeed in a particular business or a profession that you want to succeed in, always take something that you enjoy doing. Because when you enjoy doing it, you'll never have a day of work in your life. How come? Because work is only something which takes, uh, which takes, which, which comes about because a person is involved in the activity that he feels is uncomfortable. But if he enjoys doing something, it no longer becomes an aspect of work because he enjoys it. Now, now, since we have to live in the world, of course, you've got things to do. We have to take care of ourselves. We're going to live here for 70, 80, or 120 years. We can't just sleep through life. We have to do things and keep ourselves busy no matter what it is. But the best thing that we can do is to do something that we enjoy doing, which does not distract us to make us think that life is about slavery and hard work. Life should be something that has satisfaction to it. According to Rabbi Chia, the greatest vocation that we can involve ourselves in is, in fact, the study of Torah. This is what brings us close to Hashem. This is the meaning behind life. 
This allows us to express ourselves, to grow, and to understand indeed what life is all about. So Rabbi Chia would say, God, may it be your will, when he finished his tefillah, of course, may it be your will that your Torah becomes our vocation. How can that take place? Usually only when I have the financial means to do it. So if I have to work every single day at a minimum wage job, and I have to be out of the apartment at five o'clock in the morning so that I can arrive at work by eight o'clock. It's a long journey to get to work. And my work finishes at seven o'clock and I only get home at 10 o'clock in the evening. Well, what type of a life will I ever have in terms of my spiritual growth? I'll be forced into a life of somewhat slavery where I'm working every single day in the hope of eventually getting to a stage where I can retire and perhaps have a few bob that will keep me going for a few more years where I'll be able to relax and try to enjoy the money that I might have earned if I get there, of course. However, the person who has wealth behind him already, or he has the faith to keep himself going, that he believes he's got the wealth to keep going, can occupy himself in the study of Torah. According to Rabbi Chia, the greatest blessing that we can ask of God is to help us that our Torah study should be our vocation. And may our heart not become, let's say, depressed, translated here as faint. And may our eyes not darken, which means to say, help us that we should always be able to see. Of course, sight is probably the biggest blessing that we have within our bodies. And it's per perhaps the worst thing that we can have happen to a person if he's, God forbid, blind and unable to see and interact with the world through the sense of sight. And we say to God, please let our eyes always be open. They shouldn't be dim. And of course, on a much deeper level, Rabbi Chia, who's telling us about the idea of making Torah our craft, our vocation, that's what we need to do. He's telling us also a hint. Please don't dim our eyes from realizing the importance of connecting through what the Torah is all about. Our real desire should be to serve you, God, to study Torah, fulfill mitzvahs, to pray, to connect with you, to do acts of kindness and goodness and whatever else it may be. Don't let my eyes dim. There's a spiritual hint. Don't let me not see things correctly, because if I don't see things correctly, I can spend my entire life wasted away until the day that I die and suddenly open up my eyes moments before I'm going to die and say, I think I got it all wrong. That must surely be the hardest uh, punishment, the hardest retribution that a person can ever have in his life to get to the age of 80 or 90 and he's on his deathbed. Perhaps he knows he's got a few days to live and he looks back on his life and he thinks to himself, is that what I achieved? Was that really what life was? Surely I should have thought about what my life was going to be when I was much younger. And that is the path that I should have engaged in. God, please help that our eyes should not be dimmed. Let us see things as we should in the right way so that we engage in life activities in the right way day and night. Wow, these are powerful words, powerful blessings. Again, internalize these messages as much as I am trying to internalize it. Be a partner with me in working through these ideas so that we should value these powerful words and the difference it can make in our lives. Rav, now we come to the next rabbi, the great Rav. Basad Batar Slotei, after he would pray, or Marhaki, he would say the following words. May it be the will of your will, God, Hashem, our God. That you should give to us a lengthy life. Very important. If we don't have a long life, how will we serve God? We need time to serve God. It's going to take time. We've got to get through the Talmud. 2,711 pages. Don't expect to do it in one day or two or three or four. And even if you do it in a year. It's still going to do seven pages a day to get through it in one year. That's still a lot of work to do. Well, that's only one part of Torah. And what about the Shulchan Aruch with its couple of thousand pages? And then you must learn all the other types of Shulchan Aruchs as well. Aruch HaShulchan, perhaps. The Shulchan Aruch HaRav. And all the different other sections of the Shulchan Aruch. What about learning all the teachings of Arizal? All these Kabbalistic teachings and secrets of the Torah. What about the Midrashim? What about the Rishonim and Achorinim? Look how much I have to learn. Hashem, please give me a length and long life 
so that I might engage in all of these things, not wasting the days away until eventually when I get to 80 years old and I say, it's time to retire. I think I'm going to start learning what the shas is all about. Okay, guys, let's start learning. Open up to page number one. What is this? Somebody says, that's a Hebrew letter. Oh, a Hebrew letter. Can you teach me to read Hebrew? And then the person wants to acquire all of shas before he dies. It's not going to be easy. Please, God, keep my eyes open. Do not let my eyes dim. So that ultimately, each, each, each of these blessings, each of these endings really is just one on top of the other, is giving us insight into how we have to pray to God and ask him for what blessing is all about. Many people don't know what to ask of God. What must I ask of him? Please, God, bless me with wealth. All right, I'm finished asking already. Let's get on with lunch. But here are some powerful words that teach us the type of things that we should be asking God for. Titain lanu chayim Give us long life, God. Chayim shel shalom. Chayim life of peace. It's no good having a long life. Nobody wants a long life. Uh, of course, if you want the long life, you've got to have it with peace. Peace is the ultimate vessel. The most important vessel in this world that God can rest in is the vessel of peace. If we have, for example, a marriage, and within the marriage, there's fighting every single day. And the couple remain married for 60 years, every day fighting, the one screaming at the other. What type of a lengthy marriage is this when we speak about all that they did was fight with each other? Length of days, long life is beautiful when there is peace within those days. Chaim shel tova, a life of goodness. Chaim shel bracha. Perhaps you've heard these words somewhere, perhaps in the Rosh Hashanah davening or the Yom Kippur davening or somewhere else we hear these words coming out. May we have a life of goodness. May we have a life of blessing. It's no good to have life if you don't have blessing. It's no good to have a long life if you don't have peace. Thinking about giving blessing to somebody else, use these same words. These are the ultimate words. You, you ever get that opportunity? You're going to be writing a card. It's coming to Rosh Hashanah and you want to wish somebody a happy Rosh Hashanah. We say there, I wish you happy Rosh Hashanah. But look how many beautiful things we can wish the person. I wish you a long life. I wish you a life of peace. I wish you a life of goodness. I wish you a life of blessing. Chaim shel panasa. A life of panasa. And these also, these words come about as we speak about when we bench for the new month. We also use these words. We always ask God for all these different types of blessings for the new month. Chaim shel chilutz A life where, the, where we have freedom of movement, where body can move. It's no good if we have a life and the body is stuck and the body's in pain and we're unable to move about. We need to have freedom of movement. Now, freedom of movement doesn't just mean our physical body. It also means having the freedom of movement to move about from place to place. I need to go to shul, but the shul is far from me. Now, I can't walk all the distance to shul. Please, God, grant me the blessing that I can have a type of a vehicle so that I can get to the shul. I need this freedom, and freedom costs money. Please, God, give me all these things so that I can serve you in the best possible manner. Chaim sheyesh bahem yiras chet, a life which has within it fear of sin. It's no good having a life where a person is engaged in all sorts of frivolous activity, mischief, mischief makers, mavle olam, the types of people in this world who are mischief makers, destroying life for everybody, believing that this is what life is all about. No, I pray to God, please God. Grant me that I should understand what fear of heaven is. Please, God, grant me a life which does not have within it any shame or embarrassment. If you're going to give me long life and life of goodness and panasa, can you imagine how many things I could do that would go wrong with all this blessing? So we say to God, please bless me with the life where there won't be any embarrassment. It's so easy. A person lives for 70, 80, or 120 years. It's so easy that at one moment in his, in, his, in his life, he can slip up and people will mock him for it. And people will speak badly his, his whole life forever. And even when he dies, people will continue to speak badly about him and say, oh, what a terrible person he was. He did this particular thing in his life. And oh, what an embarrassment he really was to society. So we say to God, please, God, let me be able to live a life 
which has fear of heaven and where there is no embarrassments or shame whatsoever. What else did he ask God for? Rav would ask, Chaim shall oshe the kavod, a life of wealth and honor. Please, God, bless me with money. Please, God, without money, I can do nothing. I'm humiliated already. If I don't have money, no matter how long I live, I live in a state of humiliation amongst all those who know me. And they say to me, they say, oh, you study Torah. And how do you support yourself? I say, well, I'm not quite sure what to answer. Maybe I teach. Maybe I do this. Maybe I do that. And they scoff and they laugh, whatever. And they say, well, where's your apartment? You say, well, I can't afford it yet. Ha ha. That's very interesting. That's very funny. So you're telling me that you're involving yourself in the life of Torah, which is supposed to bring you close to God. And God is going to bless you. And look at what you have to go through. All this pain and suffering that you don't have the means to take care of yourself. What an embarrassment. We say to God, Chaim shall kavod. Please, God, grant me a life of wealth and honor. Let me not be embarrassed in front of everybody all the time. Chaim banu avas teira, the yirat shamayim. Let me have a life in which it has within it love of teira and fear of heaven. Who can ask for anything more? I need to learn to love the teira. It's all too easy to open up a gemara or the Shulchan Aruch, or anything, and find oneself falling asleep and saying, I don't know what this is all about. Who wrote it anyway? And maybe some man wrote it. I'm bored. Ah, Vas Torah, please God, grant me that love of Torah. You know, like I love chocolates, or I love uh, fancy cars, or I love whatever it is that I love, whatever my desire is. Let that same feeling apply to the study of Torah so that when I open up a book, I am as just excited with open up this, opening up this book as I would be in eating that chocolate bar or in driving that fancy sports car. Well, whatever it is, I ask, Lahavdil, I ask for this love of Torah and Yirat Shamayim. Please, God, grant me fear of heaven. It is, in fact, it, it's a mitzvah. Ask God to help with the fear of heaven because it is unacceptable to engage in a relationship with God where one is so in love with God that one forgets to fear him. You know, I love God so much. I'm sure he will never mind if I break this mitzvah of his. I know that this God has told me not to eat pork, for example, in the Jewish world. A Jew may not have pork, but you know, I love God so much and I feel so close to him. I'm certain God will not be angry with me if I eat pork. I'm sure God will not be angry with me if I break Shabbos. Because I love God so much, surely he won't be angry with me for doing these things. We say to God, bless me with Yirat Shamayim. I want Yirat Chait. I want the fear of heaven. I want of sin. I want Yirat Shamayim. I want the fear of heaven. Chaim, shetamalei lanu es kol mishalos libeinu letova. Listen to these beautiful words. Please, God, bless me with a life that should be full, filling up with us of all of our, uh, our desire, uh, uh, of the requests of our heart for the good. Perhaps these are perhaps some of the most powerful words we can see in the aspect of prayer and the aspect of blessing another person. Whenever we bless another person, let us remember that these words here should surely be the most powerful words that we can have on our tongue to bless another person with. What is that? I bless you like I would want God to bless me. I bless you also. That God should fulfill all your heart's desires, all of your wishes for the good. What does it mean for the good? Because many times people wish things for themselves that ultimately are not so good at all. For example, a person might say, well, if I was a multi-billionaire, then I would have everything. Oh, I wish that you should be a multi-billionaire. No, that is not correct. What we say is, I wish you your heart's desires for the good, which means whatever desire you have in your heart, may God bring this event to be something good for you and not something bad. It shouldn't be a stumbling block for you. It should be something that brings you to a higher level. What do you want? Wealth. I wish you the wealth, your heart's desires for the good. Make sure that if it's something that you need, that it's ultimately going to bring to a stage of goodness. Look at these beautiful words that we're reading over here. We ask God for these things for ourselves. And we can use these same words as a means 
for blessing other people as well. Look at the words of the sages. I'm sorry to repeat it so many times. I feel the need to do it. The sages have the art of language. And what they're teaching us is that when we use our tongues, we use our tongues to bring blessing and goodness into the world. The world is filled with enough filth and dirt of people using their mouths in such a bad manner. They use it to discredit other people, lashon hara, hurt other people, insult other people. They use it for swearing, literally swear words, uncomfortable words. You can see the disgusting manner of use that they use their tongues for. But when the sages are praying to Hashem, look how they use their tongues. Hashem, grant me peace, grant me wealth, grant me goodness, grant me honor, grant me this, no embarrassment, no shame. These are powerful lessons for us. Rabbi, Rabbi, meaning Rabbi Yehuda Nasi, the author of the Mishnah, the redactor of the Mishnah, in other words. But uh, say, after he would pray, meaning at the end of his prayer again, Omar Hachi, he would say the following. May it be your will before you, Hashem our God, and the God of our forefathers. Please God, save us from those arrogant people of Azei Panim. Azei Panim means they've got these really hard faces. Perhaps you've met such people when you look at them in the face. You can actually see they've got hard faces, not soft, gentle faces. You look at their features, hardness. Why do they have this hardness? Because of their arrogance. They are so arrogant that the arrogance begins to shine, if I can use that word, off their face. Well, not really shining. It's really the opposite. It really dulls the face. But this is what they have. They are aze panim arrogant people, ume azus panim, and also from arrogance ourselves. Please, God, save me from having to encounter an arrogant person. Every single day, we know that we meet people in our day-to-day -day activities who are extremely arrogant. We say to God, please, God. Well, this is what Rav would say, uh, Rabbi would say in any case. Please, God, save me that I should not encounter these people on a daily basis. In these, some of these words, of course, we do actually say within our prayer, for those who pay attention to the different parts of prayer, we can see sometimes where these words come about, whether it's every single day, whether it's on a festival, whatever it may be, different occasions, we actually do use these words. But we can use these words anytime that we want to. If anybody wants to, you can write down all of these prayers, compile it in a sheet, and then when you get to the end of your Shemona essay, you can recite all of these things out if you want to, because they are so beautiful. Save me from arrogant people and save me from being an arrogant person. May Adam Ra save me from an evil person. Umi Pegara save me from an evil happening, uh, bad mishap. Miyetzera save me God from the evil inclination. May Haver Ra from an evil friend. Interesting words, from an evil friend? Well, if he's your friend, he's not going to be evil. Not so. He'll be your friend. Ah, well, you know, sometimes there are friends that we have who are not necessarily on our side. This can be an evil friend. See, we think many times that the friends that we have are always out there looking for our best. But many times, the closest friends that we have are the people who are not interested in our best. But externally, they always show this external veneer as if they are on our side, etc., etc. But the reality shows different. And sometimes the closest friend that we have is a person who is just curious about where we're heading and is actually not thinking of our best, who is not looking for our best. Hashem, please save me from Havera if I do have any friends like that who are not really out for my best interests, who are not out in promoting what I do, helping me succeed in my own life wishing the best for me because there's an evil eye perhaps somewhere along the way. Save me from the chavera. Mishachenra, save me from an evil neighbor. Those who live in condominiums know well the dangers of the neighbors that one can encounter and the mischief that so many of them can get up to. Sometimes one doesn't even want to bump into them in the lift. 
in the elevator. One doesn't want to bump into them in the stairs. One doesn't want to bump into them anywhere. One doesn't even want to know that they exist sometimes. God forbid. But unfortunately, such is the situation. Save me from a bad neighbor. Every single day we have to dive into God. That there are so many people around us, people who are slightly further away from us, people who are closer to us. We have to say to God, please, God, save me from all these people, even the evil neighbor just across the way who gets great satisfaction in ruining my life. Umi Satan Hamashkis, save me from the destroying, accusing force, the destructive Satan. Umi Din Kasher, save me from a harsh judgment. What is a harsh judgment? A harsh judgment is anything that happens to a person whereby judgment is executed against him for something that he did wrong. And the judgment is very strong. As we know, if a person, for example, in the secular courts, if a person is issued, God forbid he did something wrong, and the judge issues him with a lifetime sentence in prison, and the fellow is only 20 years old, he knows the rest of his life is in prison. That is what is called din kasher, that is harsh judgment. Another type of harsh judgment is a person being sent to the death sentence for doing something wrong in the secular court. But a harsh judgment can be anything. A harsh judgment can be walking out into the road, God forbid, and something happens to a person, um, somebody pushes him over and he has a bit of an accident, whatever it could be, whatever the case may be, we're not giving examples to, to, to awaken these um, forces to get ideas of what can actually happen. This is called din kasher. We say, please, God, save me from a harsh judgment. Umi bal din kasher. And save me also from a harsh opponent, somebody somebody who is a, uh, somebody who is a, uh, a person who is filled with din. Who is the person who is filled with din? Like, for example, that neighbor. The neighbor who you knocked on his door at eight o'clock in the evening because you wish to make a payment of some kind, and he's ready to have a fight because you have woken him up at eight o'clock in the evening. Although he might play his music at 11 o'clock in the evening and disturb you, but as far as he's concerned, when you knocked on his door at eight o'clock in the evening, that was disruptive to him. And therefore he feels the need to involve himself now in a fight and antagonism against you. Save me from a baldin kashe. Bain Shehu bin Brit, whether he is Jewish, Bain Sheeno bin Brit, whether he is not Jewish, whether he is a member of the covenant or whether he is not a member of the covenant, which means to say he doesn't have a priest, which means to say he's not Jewish. For Afal Gav, and even though it is, the Kaimi Ketsutsei Alei Terabi, even though it was that there stood around Rabbi a number of officers protecting him. It was known that Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Huda Nasi, from King Antoninos, he appointed, because he had a good relationship with Rabbi, that he appointed for him uh, guards who would protect him because he was a very great man in the Jewish people and he had like bodyguards. And even though Rabbi uh, Yehuda Nasi had these bodyguards, he still would pray this prayer, which means to say, bodyguards or not, we are still all in the hands of God. And it takes just one wrong movement for something terrible to happen. Bodyguards or not. And therefore, the ultimate bodyguard, capital B, of the world, meaning God, G-O-D, as opposed to bodyguard, G-U-A-R-D, he is the ultimate bodyguard, God, and he is the one who protects us from all these things. And therefore, we need to pray to God every single day that he save us from all of these things, even when we think that we've got all the protection that we need, even though we think we've had all the best martial artists to take care of us, protect us, should anything go wrong, we've got the money to pay all these people, and we're sure that we're protected. Still, it is vital that we pray to God to help us, to protect us on our journey in life, and of course, we ask for all of these things. We are not yet finished with all these beautiful blessings, as you're going to see in our next lesson. But in the meantime, we've reached our end at this point in time. So I want to thank you very much for joining me. I'm Eliyahu Shir from Chesed Ve'emet, our site, www.lovingkindness.co. And I say to you, if you have enjoyed this lesson, please do, and I'd really appreciate it, if you would give me a thumbs up by clicking on the thumbs up button, the like button on the video below. 
And of course, subscribe to my channel if you haven't. Share these videos. Let others know what we're doing. And feel free to be in touch with me anytime by visiting my website, sending me an email. We can discuss anything that you want. Torah, growth, life, whatever it is on your mind. Perhaps you'd like to join me for a private Shi'ur one-on-one, just like we're doing now. This is a group Shi'ur, but you're welcome to join me in a private Shi'ur on any subject that you want to. I also teach Safrut, and you can learn to become a Sofer and write your own mezuzah. And I also give lessons to Khatanim who are preparing to get married to grooms who are preparing to marry and need to know the laws of marriage. My wife, in fact, gives the lessons for the Kalot, helping them along their journey to know all about the beautiful values involved in a married life. Crucial values, crucial halachot. We all need to learn it. So if you're in need of learning these things, please be in touch with us. We'd be delighted to teach you more. Thanks again for joining me. And I look forward to another Shi'ur in the near future. And I wish you, as always, everything of the very best as we learn in the Shi'ur. That is what we're supposed to be wishing each other. That is the language we're supposed to be using towards each other. Wishing the best, hoping for the best, and looking with a good eye to the, to the, to the, to the needs of others and the wishes that they, they succeed in their life, just as we should succeed too. Thanks a lot. Wishing you the best. Signing off for now. Shalom, shalom. Bye-bye.